Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I am Dr. Renu M, fellow in Vitreo Retina and Ocular Oncology. I am going to take you through this month's top six articles. Starting with the first article. The purpose of the study was to report the anatomic outcomes and retinal structure changes from lens pairing vitrectomy for eyes with stage 3 or 4 familial exudative vitreoretinopathy. They included 133 eyes of 119 patients with stage 3 or 4 FEVR who underwent LSV. They found out that 129 eyes, that is 97 person, achieved traction relief through one LSV surgery. The extent of RD improved in 98 eyes, that is 73.7 person. It remained stable in 32 eyes, that is 24.1 person, and progressed in three eyes, that is 2.3 person. They found out that at long term follow up, 39 eyes had completely reattached retina and 60, that is 45.1% eyes partially reattached retina. They also found out that the median change of the venular angle was 3.6 degree and minus 9 degree for the temporal and the nasal vessels respectively. The main disc fovea distance was 0.3 papillary diameter shorter and the mean temporal venular arcuate distance was 0.02 papillary diameter larger. Thus, they concluded that the LSV or the lens sparing vitrectomy can relieve vitreoretinal traction and reattach the retina in late stage FEVR eyes and the improvements in temporal and nasal venular angle and disc fovea distance reflect positive retinal structure changes for the patients. Moving on to the second article. This was done to assess the functional outcomes in visual acuity, metamorphopsia and vision related quality of life and to evaluate prognostic factors after macular buckling surgery in eyes with high myopia and foveoschisis associated macular detachment. 39 eyes of 39 patients with foveoschisis associated macular detachment who underwent macular buckling surgery were enrolled in the study. The measured outcomes comprised the BCBA, metamorphopsia, vision related quality of life, hereby mentioned as VRQOL the axial length, macular reattachment, and resolution of foveoschisis. In addition, factors affecting final BCVA and metamorphopsia were also analyzed. They found out that at 12 months post-op, 36 eyes, that is 92.31%, achieved macular reattachment. 37 eyes, that is 94.87%, achieved complete resolution of the foveoschisis. And metamorphopsia diminished in 31 eyes, that is 79.49%. Metamorphopsia scores showed improvement and all wish function questionnaire, that is 25 subscales, demonstrated significant improvement postoperatively with the exception of general health and driving. They further added that the preoperative BCVA was an independent risk factor for postoperative BCVA at 12 months and the preoperative M score or the metamorphopsia score was an independent risk factor for the postoperative M score at month 12. Thus, they concluded that macular buckling surgery significantly improved the BCVA, metamorphopsia and VRQOL in patients with pruishisis associated macular detachment. The preoperative BCVA and metamorphopsia score were prognostic factors for postoperative BCVA and metamorphopsia score at 12 months. Moving on to the third article, this was a single center retrospective study which was conducted to compare the anatomical and functional outcomes of four different techniques for the treatment of large idiopathic full thickness macular hole. They included 129 eyes of 106 patients with a large macular full thickness macular hole of more than 500 micron. All patients underwent 23 or 25 gauge vitrectomy and gas with standard ILM peel pedicle transposition, inverted or free flap technique. Post-operative OCT images were assessed by two independent masked graders. They found out that the overall anatomical success was 81%. It was significantly lower, that is 59% for the standard ILM peel alone. The pedicle transposition flap showed superior visual recovery compared with the free flap. 
At three months, restoration of the external limiting membrane was significantly better for the pedicle transposition flap compared with the free flap and also the standard ILM peel. And it was superior to all the other techniques at six months post-op. Thus, they concluded that the standard ILM peel alone offers inferior outcomes for the management of a large full thickness macular hole and of all the alternate ILM techniques. Despite similar closure rates, the foveal microstructural recovery is most complete following the pedicle transposition flap and least complete following the free flap. Moving on to the next article. This was conducted to explore the clinical features and significance of notch in reactivation of retinopathy of prematurity, also called the ROP, post-intravitreal ranimizumab monotherapy, hence fourth mentioned as IVR. 96 infants with type 1 or aggressive ROP, also known as AROP, post-IVR monotherapy was retrospectively analyzed. 51 eyes were notch present and 122 eyes were notch absent. General demographics and the clinical outcomes were compared by the notch status for the type 1 and AROP. They found out that the notch primarily appeared in stage 2 ROP at the junction of zone 1 and zone 2 and on the temporal side in type 1 ROP and AROP. Notch was present in the type 1 ROP group before the first IVR but post-treatment in the AROP group. A significantly higher reactivation rate, longer follow-up duration and a post-menstrual age at last follow-up were seen also in the notch present group when compared to the notch minus group. And in the notch plus group, the mean gestational age was significantly lower in reactivated versus regressed eyes. Thus, they concluded that the notches appeared at different times but similar locations in type 1 ROP and AROP. The reactivation rate after IVR was increased in ROP with notches and the notch may be a useful biomarker for reactivation after IVR in ROP. Moving on to the next article. The title being the mini steam roll, an abbreviated variation of the steam roller manure following pneumatic retinopexy for recometigenous retinal detachment. The purpose was to describe a novel positioning manure for patients with recometigenous retinal detachment following pneumatic retinopexy. This was a single center prospective case series of primary RRD. Six patients who presented with primary bullous RRD and a sizable superior break were enrolled. All patients underwent pneumoretinopexy, baseline ultra-wide field fundus imaging and repeat imaging 10 minutes after the gas injection was performed. And after pneumoretinopexy, patients were instructed to perform the mini steam roll manure, which consists of a face down position for 10 minutes, followed by positioning to the retinal break. The reduction of the SR of volume after the initial phase down position was evaluated with the clinical examination and ultra wide field imaging. They found out that the mini steam roll manure resulted in a rapid and significant reduction of SRF in all patients with bullous RRD and large superior breaks allowing SRF to be expressed into the vitreous cavity with 10 minutes of phase down positioning. And they also went ahead to say that the primary retinal reattachment was achieved in all cases. Thus, they concluded that the mini steam roll manure may be a suitable alternative for patients positioning following pneumoretinopexy in certain cases, which also has the potential benefits of a direct to break and full steam roll manure. Moving on to the last and the final article of this month's Retina Roundup, the title be a novel automated aspiration of subretinal fluid method during scleral buckling for recmetigenous retinal detachment. The goal of the study was to introduce a modified technique for the removal of subretinal fluid during scleral buckling to treat RRD. They included 18 cases of RRD in whom a new technique of automated aspiration of the SRF was done during scleral buckling. Preoperative and intraoperative situations were evaluated and an SD-OCT and a scanning laser ophthalmoscopy were used to observe the absorption of SRF in the early post-operative period. They found out that the new method of automated aspiration primarily eliminated the SRF of all 18 RRD cases during serial buckling surgery, leading to retinal reattachment as shown by SLO. The method did not cause extensive intraoperative hemorrhage and had no risk of retinal incarceration or the other complications. The STOCT showed that the height of the SRF in the macular area decreased in 10 cases, that is 6.67% leaving just a thin layer that was completely clear in two cases, that is 
percent and had just a single blep in one case that is 6.67 percent and had several blebs left in two cases that is 13.3 percent thus they concluded that the automated aspiration of srf method is effective controllable and beneficial for retinal reattachment especially in the early post operative period and complications with this method were rare thank you